So the question is really, uh, you know, what, what is what is referred to as neoliberalism uh, actually coming to an end? Well, I think some people around the world think so. If you look back at events over the last year or so, uh, you've had the election of Donald Trump, who's uh, promising to put America first, you know, making America great again. How? By ripping up free trade agreements, by slapping protectionist tariffs on imports, by building a wall on the Mexican border. On Trump's first day of office, he actually signed an executive order uh, which removed the USA from the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And that's a 12-nation free trade agreement that took seven years to negotiate. It was actually the largest trade agreement in history. So you can imagine the enthusiasm, therefore, of the US diplomats who, uh, when they saw Trump take out his big pen to scribble this big order, uh, putting an end to years of their work to try and pry open this or that country to American capital. And with it as well, Trump declared, he said, the era of multinational trade agreements is over. They also closed the door on the merrily named Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, or TTIP negotiations, between the USA and the EU, which in any case actually were falling apart already, due to massive opposition from the working class in several countries. But we also had the referendum in Britain to leave the EU, you know, known as Brexit. A Britain being the first country, but I'd say certainly not the last country, to leave the uh, continent-wide free trade bloc, uh, the common market. We've also seen increasing anti-EU sentiment in a number of countries across Europe, with the rise of parties calling for their own referendums in places like France, Germany, Austria, Italy, and the Netherlands. You also have the current crisis in Catalonia, which, if it goes independent, will almost certainly uh, be ejected from the EU, and uh, as well will precipitate the further breakup of Spain. And I'll say historically as well, the growth of world trade is at an absolute low. So it was at only 1.3% in 2016, and that was following a collapse of 10% in 2015. And just to put this into contrast, during the post-war period, uh, the <coughs> uh, world trade grew at an annual rate of 12.5% each year. We've also seen the number of protectionist measures increasing worldwide, as uh, countries are trying to effectively uh, just export their unemployment. Now, according to the Global Trade Alert, who monitors such things, apparently the G20 countries have imposed more than 11,000 protectionist measures since the beginning of the crisis in 2008. So it's not just a question of Trump. And does this mean, therefore, that globalization is reaching its limits? And is this, therefore, the end of neoliberalism? Because often neo uh, globalization is kind of seen as a key plank uh, of uh, neoliberalism itself, this kind of opening up countries to uh, free trade. Now, last year, the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, uh, is often seen as the kind of bastion of uh, neoliberal policies. It published an article called Neoliberalism Oversold. Does that it so it kind of indicates a shift in mood away from kind of such policies. But does that mean that the IMF has suddenly all become Corbynites? Well, I don't think so, and I wouldn't hold your breath. But what actually is neoliberalism? Is it actually a kind of system, or is it an ideology, or is it just a set of policies? Well, I think everyone here has probably heard of liberalism, which is uh, the kind of outlook and policies, or if you like, the ideology of the, uh, the capitalist class typically associated with the kind of uh, end of the 18th and early 19th centuries. You know, figures such as John Locke, uh, Thomas Hobbes, Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, and so on. And it's associated with things like defense of private property as a source of all freedom, the invisible hand of the market kind of operating to maximize wealth and happiness for everybody, the, uh, the limited role of the state, you know, the state shouldn't interfere, and also the, uh, the promotion of free trade and globalization. And it became the dominant ideology of capitalism as it corresponded to the material interests of the dominant section of the ruling class at that time. And it was these interests kind of boiled down, if you like, into the language of philosophy and economics that kind of becomes that ideology. So how is that different from neoliberalism? Well, I say not much, really. You know, when people refer to neoliberalism, they're usually referring to the sorts of policies enacted by capitalist governments around the world since the kind of late 70s and uh, 1980s. So it's particularly uh, associated with those of the Pinochet regime in Chile, with uh, Thatcher in Britain, and Reagan in the USA but actually pretty much with all governments uh, since that period. I, and the, the ideas are kind of things, that, again, the idea that the market is king, everything should be marketized, uh, that state interference should be rolled back from everything, uh, everything should be privatized, opened up to capitalism, that nearly everything should be deregulated. You know, they talk about a bonfire of regulations, or you know, just we need to cut red tape and all these things. There's uh, all protectionist tariffs and uh, subsidies should be uh, abolished. And also, economies therefore opened up to foreign trade and uh, foreign capital 
and therefore allow globalization to flourish. It's also associated with uh, monetarist, i.e. supply-side economic policies, most, champ most notably championed by uh, Milton Friedman and his associates, but also going back to people like Friedrich Hayek, i.e. ideas that the state shouldn't interfere in the economy except to regulate the money supply, and uh, typically be doing so by uh, ben manipulating interest rates through control of the central bank. And this was seen in contrast to Keynesian policies, I, where governments would actively try and uh, intervene in the economy to stimulate demand you know, through public spending. And this was, in effect, uh, therefore going back to kind of pre-World War II uh, kind of economic policies of balanced budgets by slashing public spending and actually uh, <coughs> making the working class pay for this shortfall through austerity policies, through cuts to, to wages and welfare and so on. So there's nothing really new, I would say, in terms of the ideas. So why there's all this fuss about neoliberalism? Well, I'd say the problem is kind of really when people try and portray neoliberalism as something that's kind of uh, distinct from capitalism, as if it's some, some set of just nasty ideas that kind of somehow took over the world from the 1980s onwards, and then it adds up to some kind of evil system in, in itself, as uh, something that's kind of separate from capitalism as, as a system. And you hear, therefore, time and time again from reformist leaders uh, that... <coughs> What we need to do, uh, you know, reformist leaders in the, in the working class parties, the trade unions and so on, that uh, we just need an end to neoliberalism. And if we just end neoliberalism, that'll be it. We can just end, it'll end austerity. It'll be as simple as that. But they don't specify how they're going to do this. Or often they don't specify what kind of policies they want to put in its place. And it's implicit that this idea that if we just somehow got rid, rid of neoliberal politicians and people ruling us with these kind of uh, awful ideas, that uh, we could just have a return to the conditions of the post-war boom and uh, <coughs> full employment, rising living standards and all, and all the rest. But I'll say that this is a very idealistic way to view the world. And I don't mean idealistic in terms of uh, like utopian, but I mean in a philosophical sense. As, uh, I, as in seeing ideas and ideology or kind of policies as, uh, <coughs> as primary, but ignoring the material conditions that actually give rise to these ideas in the first place. Now, as Marxists, we're materialists. We understand that ideas or policies don't just fall from the sky, but that they're ultimately rooted in the material, i.e. economic conditions of society. And not in a crude, like, mechanical way, uh, but in a very complex and contradictory fashion. It's not that just some, some change happens in the economy, and it's like a kind of mechanical uh, device that just automatically changes the ideas. I would say it's, uh, although it's ultimately the economic relations between people that uh, form the root of our conceptions of the world. Uh, so to take, for example, different ideas of freedom and equality. If you went back to slave society in ancient Rome or Greece, there was no kind of concept of uh, you know, universal human rights or you know, freedom, equality, fraternity, and so on. Uh, but it was with the development of capitalism, which actually required this idea of equality between people, that you get these kind of ideas. But I'll say it's, uh, <coughs> it's once ideas uh, become entrenched as a kind of uh, ruling set of ideas, as an ideology, they can actually react back on the economic base itself, and they can even come into conflict with it. So, for example, take the ideas of the Catholic Church in, uh, in, in feudal times, what's known as kind of the Dark Ages, uh, in holding back scientific discovery and, uh, and progress. So if we're properly to understand neoliberalism in order to actually end it, then uh, we need to understand the material conditions which gave rise to it in the first place. And I would say that requires a dialectical understanding of the world, I mean, we need to see the phenomena and its interconnection to the whole and as part of the process. You know, it's not a kind of rigid or fixed uh, static uh, thing. So, for example, what were the general trends in the world economy in uh, the previous period? And how did this impact on the class struggle? And importantly as well, we need to have an all-sided view of this uh, development. You know, we can't just see it as simply this or that whim of, of this politician uh, from the ruling class. You have to also understand what was going on on the other side of the class struggle. Uh, <clears throat> what was going on in the labour movement? What were the policies of the labour leaders during this time? And not just in one country, but internationally. All these things come together. So uh, in order to do this, it's actually necessary to go back further a bit in history and uh, to understand the post-war period, uh, the kind of period before what is uh, kind of referred to as, uh, as, as the neoliberal period. I would say it's, it's impossible to understand what is referred to as neoliberalism, you know, to the extent that we can speak of it as a kind of set of policies or ideas, without understanding what was going on before it. Because uh, <clears throat> that's vital if we're to, to offer a guide to action, 
you know, how do we take society forward? You know, is it enough to simply just reject neoliberalism? And uh, what do we replace these policies with? Is it Keynesianism? Now, as Marxists, we say, no, Keynesianism doesn't work. We need socialism. But in order to actually explain that like, more thoroughly, and rather than just assert it, we need to actually understand what went on during the classical period of Keynesianism, i.e. the post-war boom, and also uh, you know, just before, during, and after the Second World War. So I'd say that the post-war boom, I think it's fair to call it the, kind of the golden age of capitalism. And it's portrayed as a period when uh, capitalism supposedly worked, or at least in the West. You had uh, things like full employment. You had secure jobs for life. You had rising wages. You had decent pensions. You had welfare provision, social housing, all these kind of things. <laughs> However, there's a tendency to view these kind of things very idealistically. I uh, simply as just the result of a certain set of policies, uh, what was called the post-war consensus, which in effect really just amounted to uh, Keynesian ideas, a uh, deficit financing. Now it's important that we understand the real material basis. Uh, that, gave, uh, that made this boom possible. And I think that is important as well to understand that this, this boom, this whole period of uh, 25 years or more, uh, massively shaped the consciousness of those who lived through it, and even many who didn't live through it. And many think it's simply just the normal operation of capitalism, and that uh, rather than seeing it as, a, as, as really a historical deviation, if you take ca capitalism in the long term. <laughs> now, Ted Grant, who's one of the founders of the International Marxist Tendency, he wrote an excellent article during the middle of the boom in 1960 called Will There Be a Slum? And I'd encourage everybody here to read it. And he was writing, this as many on the left at the time, even many so-called Marxists, thought that capitalism has fundamentally changed. They thought that it has completely transformed itself. And they thought that there'd be no more boom and bust. They thought there'd be no more unemployment. And there was some, some simply develop into socialism. This is a very kind of empirical and kind of surface level understanding of things. They just saw, oh, okay, well, there hasn't been a major crisis for a number of years, therefore things have changed. And uh, Ted Grant said, no, capitalism hasn't changed. A slump will inevitably come as night follows day. But we have to understand the reasons for the boom in order to not lose our heads and not get uh, you know, sucked along with uh, those who think things have changed. And he listed these changes as following. Number one, he said that it was the political factor the political failure rather, of the Stalinists and the Social Democrats around the world to actually lead the revolutionary wave that followed at the end of the war to, to victory. And in doing so, they actually prepared the political climate for the restoration and recovery of capitalism. Secondly, there was the destructive effects of the war itself in destroying a mass of the means of production, uh, also stocks of consumer goods and, and so on, in a very similar way, in fact, the, the same kind of way that a crisis works to kind of eliminate a crisis of overproduction. And that you know, all these goods are, are, are wiped out, kind of resetting the, uh, the clock on capitalism. Thirdly, the Marshall Plan, which was equivalent to about 130 billion US dollars in today's money, uh, <clears throat> it was given or loaned to countries, particularly in Western Europe, uh, to create a buffer against the USSR. It was obviously a political question. Uh, and also cut across revolutionary developments which were going on in these countries. And in doing so, this money was used to buy back goods from America, but also to soften the need for austerity measures in these countries. Four was the enormously increased investment in industry, uh, particularly with the growth of new industries that were developed during the war. So things like plastics, aluminium, rockets, electronics, and atomic energy. Uh, five was the actual inc increasing output, the increase, increasing productivity of these newer industries. There's things like in the, uh, the chemical industry, artificial fibres, synthetic rubbers, you know, plastic, light metals, and so on. Uh, <coughs> it benefited from a general development of science and technology, uh, plus new methods of industrial management and, uh, and supply chains, leading to a general rise in productivity. So there's six. There's a huge amount of uh, fictitious capital created by arms spending, and that was, that was uh, thought to account for about 10% of GDP in countries such as uh, Britain and uh, the USA. Seven, he pointed out to the role of the colonial revolutions and uh, <coughs> the independence of these undeveloped countries, giving the, uh, the local uh, ruling class in those countries the increased opportunity to develop the industry there, but also the increased demand for raw materials that was coming from this, uh, this boom, the knock-on effects in the advanced capitalist countries themselves. Eight, you had the role of state intervention. You know, for example, in the creation of welfare states, which was kind of softening the impact of uh, unemployment. But you also had nationalization of unprofitable industries. Things like steel, coal, transport, uh, power, 
they used state financing in effect to take over these ruined industries uh, which were shattered during the war, develop them up, and then use these, uh, you know, these kind of key elements uh, of the economy to provide cheap materials and energy for the rest of the capitalist economy. Nine was also the, uh, the huge increase in trade that followed the war. So I, I mentioned there was an increase in world trade of 12.5% each year. You had the, the removal of protectionist barriers. Uh, it was actually a, pre a precondition for a lot of countries uh, <laughs> receiving aid through the Marshall Plan. But you also had the role of the International Monetary Fund and uh, what was known as the Bretton Woods system, which forced countries to maintain an a fixed exchange rate with the dollar, which was uh, backed up by gold. And this prevented competitive devaluations of uh, <coughs> you know, countries devaluing their own currency in this kind of beggar thy neighbour kind of race to the bottom. Uh, instead, it forced internal devaluations, things like wage cuts and attacks to, to benefits and so on. But tied to this was the role of the USA as a kind of hegemonic power. You know, it emerged from the war, it enormously strengthened actually. It's it was the only continent that wasn't uh, completely destroyed. And it also uh, had two thirds of the world's gold in Fort Knox. It was an, the dollar was literally as good as gold. And it was, it was enormously powerful. It became the, the, kind of, the kind of policeman of world capitalism. And all these factors interacted. They all fed back on each other, creating this kind of virtuous cycle. And since the Western economies, economies were booming, this provided the material basis for the unprecedented period of reforms that went on during this time. So when, when the pie kept getting bigger and bigger, the capitalists, under pressure from below always, don't forget that they, they didn't give these things gladly, they were prepared to throw some crumbs off the table in order to try and keep the class peace. And I'll say actually the most significant reforms, things like the welfare state in Britain and a lot of the nationalisations, actually came off the back of this revolutionary wave that uh, came about towards the end of the war. You know, when people said, you know, we're not going to go back to the conditions of the 1930s, we're not going to go back to mass unemployment and, uh, and poverty, you know, uh, we, we want something better. And uh, the capitalists were uh, kind of feeling the whole system at risk were prepared to offer, uh, concede massive reforms in order to hold on to their system as a whole. But I'll say even a lot of these reforms were kept on by, uh, by the Tories or by ruling class uh, governments, uh, <clears throat> even when uh, you know, social democratic parties uh, came out of power. And this was as the, as the whole economy was going forward, as profits were going up, there was no need for the ruling class to launch a concerted struggle against all these gains. You know, they could afford to keep them going and not risk a massive uh, clash with the working class. But I say, however, all these, despite all these factors coming together in this kind of circle of, uh, kind of never-ending growth that I described, uh, none of them fundamentally transformed capitalism. None of them actually removed its, uh, any of its major uh, or main contradictions. And therefore, inevitably, a crisis uh, uh, would break out. Now, Marx and Engels noted in the Communist Manifesto when they talk about crises, they say the conditions of bourgeois society are too narrow to comprise the wealth created by them. Now, what does that actually mean? Now, here they're talking about a crisis of overproduction. Too much is produced in order not for people's needs, but to be profitably absorbed by the market. And that's inevitable under capitalism, as production is only for profit. That's the only thing that, uh, that uh, concerns the capitalists. But where does that profit come from? And as Marxists, we understand it as effectively the unpaid labour of the working class. Uh, you don't receive in wages an equivalent for the full amount of value that you produce in the working day or week or month or year or, or whatever. In fact, what you receive is, is enough to keep you at a certain standard of living and which for the majority of the working class worldwide uh, is typically just enough to keep you alive and uh, kind of uh, maintain yourself and your children. And therefore, the working class has only paid a fraction of the wealth that it produces. The rest goes as surplus value to the ruling class in the form of profit, interest, and rent. Now, the, pro the problem is that the capitalists can only make a profit, they can only realise this, if they can actually sell the commodities that is produced by the working class. But if workers are only paid a fraction of that value that they produce, where will the demand <coughs> come on the market for all these commodities? Now, if that's the case, you could ask, well, why isn't capitalism in permanent crisis? How isn't there always this massive shortfall between what is produced and what is uh, bought? Well, there's several ways around this. Uh, one of those is uh, that the capitalists in one country don't just sell to the market of that country. You know, they export their goods. They try and uh, sell to the world market. And you can see this, for example, uh, in China today. Obviously, the Chinese working class can't buy what is produced by the Chinese working class, but it's, it's sold uh, primarily in Europe and uh, North America and so on. Uh, 
But as, uh, as you'll notice, it doesn't actually solve the problem. It just shifts it from one area of the world to another. The, uh, <coughs> the kind of the major way that capitalism has got over this crisis historically has actually been to, to reinvest part of this surplus uh, produced back into production itself. And that's what kind of gave capitalism its kind of progressive uh, kind of features in its heyday. And it, and it actually was forced to develop the means of production, forced to, to build more factories, more industry, more infrastructure, and so on. But the problem is, to, to, in order to actually use these, uh, these, these expanded means of production profitably, you actually have to produce more things with them. And you have to find an even bigger market in order to, to sell these things with. So ultimately, it just sets up this problem, but on an even higher level. And another major way that the capitalists use is uh, the use of credit, which, uh, which sounds wonderful. I mean, you can artificially expand the, the purchasing power of the market today, but it's at the expense of tomorrow. The catch with uh, anyone who's taken out credit uh, knows all too well is that you, know, you, can, you take out this money now, but you have to pay it back later on in the future with interest. You know, it doesn't come for free. And uh, over, <coughs> over a certain time, this kind of contradiction will, will always build up. You know, goods go unsold, companies go bust, and at a certain stage, a generalized crisis will break out. And it reaches a tipping point where all the factors that push society forward turn into their opposite and actually become a, a kind of break on the economy and everything goes into reverse. Now, if you go back to the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels then said, well, how does the bourgeoisie get over these crises? It says, well, on the one hand, by the enforced destruction of a mass of the productive forces, i.e., you know, factories are closed down, people are made unemployed and so on, but on the other hand, by the conquest of new markets and by the more thorough exploitation of the old ones. That is to say, by paving the way for more extensive and more destructive crises and by diminishing the means where crises are prevented. Now that, I think, is the key to understanding this post-war period. The ruling class got out of the depression in the 1930s through the enforced destruction of a mass of the productive forces as a result of the Second World War. And then following that war, there was a massive increase in world trade, i.e. the conquest of new markets as well as a more thorough exploitation of the old ones uh, <coughs> through technological advances and uh, through rises in productivity and so on. Now, uh, following the war, there was this massive increase... Sorry, <coughs> I was going to say, ultimately, the, the boom, all these conditions that drove uh, the, the boom forward in the, uh, <coughs> actually paved the way for the crisis in the 1970s, which really, if you look at it, was the, the first major worldwide crisis of capitalism. Now, th that was triggered by the oil crisis, which came about as a result of the Arab-Israeli war. And it led to this oil embargo, which uh, massively uh, shot up prices and led to huge deficits and defaults all around the world. But I would say that was really just the kind of accident which expressed the necessity for this crisis to break out in the first place. Uh, it could have been any kind of factor which acted as the, the, the kind of uh, the tipping point. In the same way that the collapse of the subprime mortgage uh, crisis in the USA in 2008 was simply just the, t the tipping point of a generalized crisis of overproduction. You know, it could have been another, another tipping point that um, caused this. The, the result was you ended up with what was, what was called stagflation. A uh, low growth, high unemployment, uh, lo um, <coughs> alongside uh, massive inflation. Now, according to Keynes, this wasn't supposed to be possible. High inflation was supposed to, to uh, reflect a high demand for goods, which in turn uh, would uh, uh, reflect a high demand for labor. But the, uh, <coughs> it was this kind of reason why the, the, the ruling class actually abandoned Keynesianism, you know, deficit financing, you know, printing money and, or just borrowing it in order to, to try and fund the economy, as it simply didn't work. It led to this massive inflation, which actually uh, kind of ate in and it kind of acted as a massive break on the, the further development of the economy. And I said the key point is that Keynesianism sounds wonderful. The whole point of Keynesianism is, is they see uh, the crisis as being just a lack of what they call effective demand. You know, people aren't paid enough uh, <coughs> in order to buy things. Therefore, we just need to increase that demand. We can just patch it up by uh, getting the state to, uh, to meet the shortfall. And uh, <coughs> that sounds wonderful. Uh, you know, let's just get the government to invest in things, create jobs, and, you know, build uh, infrastructure, to, you know, uh, invest in industry, and hey-ho, the problem's solved. But I said there's a small detail, and that's governments don't actually have any money of their own. You know, they, don't, uh, they don't produce this. They have to raise it through taxes, borrow it, or print it. The thing is, if you're the capitalist class, uh, <coughs> if you tax the capitalist, it comes out of their profits. And as I said earlier, the, 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 the investment for profit is the only thing why, uh, why capitalists, in, capitalists invest. If you lower the rate of profit beyond a certain point, the capitalists will just refuse to invest in that thing. They'll say, well, fine, there's no point in this. We'll take our money elsewhere where it is more profitable. 
If you tax the working class, though, you're into the very demand that you're trying to boost. You're effectively taking away with one hand and giving it back with another. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of, uh, it, it doesn't actually solve the problem in itself. Now, borrowing money, as I said earlier, the problem is it has to be paid back with interest. There's, there's clearly limits to what can be done with that. And printing money simply leads to inflation. If you put more currency into circulation than the amount of values that it's supposed to represent, it simply leads to the debasement of the currency. And that is exactly what happened in the 1970s. You saw inflation go through the roof. In Britain, it reached 9.4% in 1971, and it went up to 27% by 1975. Uh, it was combined as well with massive unemployment. There were one million people unemployed in that year. And that resulted in a massive wave of class struggle, as workers had to strike in order to keep their wages in line with this runaway inflation. The result was massive unrest. And uh, in 1972 and 1974, the British miners actually went on strike uh, several times. And this was the first time since 1926, you know, the general strike uh, that almost uh, threatened capitalism. And uh, <coughs> the demand was obviously, we need, we need higher wages. You know, we, can, we can't afford uh, basic things. Inflation is, is effectively giving us a massive uh, uh, wage uh, cut. But uh, <coughs> the second time in 1974, the Tory government who were in power at that time actually called a snap election. And they, they presented it as a question of, well, who runs the country? Is it us, the Tories, or is it the unions? Is it the miners and so on? And, uh, <clears throat> well, as it turns out, a majority of people thought, well, yes, yeah, the working class, it should be the unions. And the Tories were booted out. And they were replaced by a Labour government who came to power. And they actually settled this strike. They kind of were forced to. But ultimately, they couldn't afford the terms of uh, the, the settlement. The government therefore faced this enormous balance of payments crisis, along with a huge budget deficit which was getting out of control. And I say that if they were socialists, if they were revolutionaries, they would have taken this opportunity to actually break with capitalism. They could have taken over the commanding heights of the economy, they could use all that unrest, all that kind of momentum in the labour movement to actually to, to decisively take power out of the hands of capitalism and uh, begin planning production for need. But of course they weren't socialists, they were reformists. So they saw their option as either, on the one hand, declare bankruptcy, sacrifice the integrity of the pound, and therefore uh, shatter the interests of the City of London, or go to the, the IMF for a loan, which is precisely what they did do in uh, 1975 and 1976. Now, obviously, that loan came with massive strings attached. The IMF, don't, and they're not a humanitarian institution. They just give out money uh, for fun. The, the, namely, that was massive budget cuts and enforced austerity. So therefore, you had a Labour government brought to power on the back of a powerful miners' strike to, for higher wages, actually now demanding wage restraint from the working class as a whole in order to keep the capitalist system going. And obviously that, that, that wage restraint was, kind of, uh, was, was bitterly swallowed. For, for a year or so, people thought, well, OK, like, this, is, this is our government kind of telling us, OK, if we keep our heads down, things might get better next year. And you know, it's a kind of temporary thing. But actually it didn't solve it. And years and years afterwards, the inflation was still uh, enormously high. There was still massive unemployment. And uh, people's living standards were getting worse and worse. And uh, <coughs> that's because ultimately this crisis was a global crisis of capitalism. You can't solve it just by trying to uh, attack wages in one country or another. And it resulted in what's, uh, what's known now as the winter of discontent. Uh, this winter in 1978 and 1979, where there was a massive wave of strikes. I think the like that we've not seen uh, since in Britain. There was almost uh, 29.5 million uh, strike days uh, lost. And that was including uh, hospital workers, truck drivers all over the country, bin collectors, rubbish was piling up on the streets, and even grave diggers, bodies were actually piling up in the, in the morgues and the, the cemeteries. But since uh, the Labour government was reformist, as it was unprepared to break with capitalism, it had no solution to these problems. It couldn't offer any way out of this discontent. Uh, there was no way out except trying to kind of just balance the budgets and, uh, and make the working class pay. Now, James Callaghan, who was the Labour Prime Minister during this period, he actually told the Labour Party conference in 1976. He said, we used to think you could spend your way out of a recession and increase employment by cutting taxes and boosting government spending, i.e. Keynesian policies. He said, I tell you in all candour, that option no longer exists. And insofar as it ever did exist, it only worked on each occasion since the war by injecting a bigger dose of inflation into the economy, followed by a higher level of unemployment at the next step. Now, James Callaghan wasn't a Marxist, but it sounds very similar to Marx and Engels in the Communist Manifesto, where they talk about the way that the bourgeoisie gets out of crises by preparing even deeper and then, uh, more extensive crises in the future. And uh, 
<coughs> this is effectively why Keynesianism was abandoned by the ruling class uh, in the 70s. It was simply that it just didn't work. It was actually aggravating the crisis. It was actually leading to, to further class struggle and more unrest, and actually challenging the whole uh, capitalist system. And yeah, the, the capitalists have seen events in 1968 in, uh, in, in France and actually across the world and thought, hold on, we can, things are going out of hand here. We need to, uh, we, this, this kind of uh, situation can't go on. And that, that's ultimately why Labour lost the election in 1979 to Thatcher. It was due to this massive disappointment and disillusionment in a Labour government that was supposed to be on the side of the working class, but in effect en ended up abandoning its programme wholesale and simply just saw its job as managing capitalism and actually doing the work of the Tories. Now, when Thatcher came to power, she, did what, she simply did what was necessary from the standpoint of the ruling class to restore profitability. So, for example... So they massively attack living standards. They attack the power of organised labour. They attack the trade unions. They uh, massively deregulated the economy. They, uh, they privatised all the nationalised industries and so on. And this is the real meaning, I would argue, of what is referred to as neoliberalism. It was simply undoing the gains of the working class that were won through the past period, through struggle. And hence it opened up this whole period of counter-reforms. And uh, with Keynesianism unable to deliver, the ruling class went back over to monetarism. A strict balance, balanced budgets, the tax and wages and so on. And they, jacked, they actually jacked up the interest rate overnight under the name of taming inflation. But the effect of this actually was to massively increase unemployment. In Britain it went over 10%, it went to over 3 million uh, people. As many businesses couldn't afford to, uh, to pay their debts. And part of this was actually, I think, an inc an, a deliberate attempt to e actually increase unemployment. So as um, to better be able to take on the workers, to take on the, the trade unions and so on, and drive down conditions. Because they could always say to, to, to trade union uh, leaders and so on, oh, you're not happy with these terms? Fine, you can join the ranks of the unemployed. It's either take it or leave it. And that had a powerful effect. And in the five years between 1979 and 1984, the TUC in Britain actually lost 17% of its membership. And this was openly admitted by Alan Budd, who's one of the chief economic advisors to Thatcher, who actually said, on record, he said, the 1980s policies of attacking infl inflation by squeezing uh, the economy and public spending were, were actually a cover to bash the workers. And I would say that that was certainly the case with the miners' strike in, uh, in 1984, which was consciously provoked by the Tory government and was actually prepared for over years in advance. The government was stockpiling coal for years. And they saw the miners as historically being amongst the most militant of uh, sections of the working class, i.e. the kind of vanguard of the working class. And uh, they, they, they didn't forget the lessons of 1974, where it was the miners who brought down the Tory government. And the Tories thought that actually a defeat of the miners would, said, uh, would have a profound effect on the rest of the class. And uh, of course they were right. But I think we have to point out that the de de defeat of the miners wasn't automatic. The miners fought heroically. And actually, they had enormous support throughout the working class, actually not just in Britain, but internationally. And I would say the only reason for the defeat was actually the timidity and, uh, of the, Labour, the TEC and the Labour Party leaders who were unprepared to actually spread that strike, spread the struggle and into a general strike and actually bring down the Thatcher government and replace it with something different. And uh, that's not an accident, but that actually flows from the very logic of reformism itself. Since the reformists have no programme to actually fundamentally change society, particularly in a period of crisis. You know, uh, they, <coughs> they back down from any kind of serious struggle against the capitalists, which risks going beyond the limits of the capitalist system itself. You know, they, they thought, okay, if we bring the, the, the Tories down, and then what? We're in power doing the same thing that the Tories are trying to do. So uh, <coughs> they, uh, they, they, they're afraid of a mass movement developing beyond the limits that they're kind of safe to see it. And this is ultimately because they don't have confidence or they don't believe that working class people can actually run society themselves without the, uh, the need for a you know, layer of bankers and capitalists and so on and their managers to actually uh, kind of you know, stand at the top of society and siphon off all this wealth. I, they don't believe in socialism. They don't think it's possible. Therefore, they accept the capitalist system. The result of this uh, defeat, therefore, uh, was a powerful demoralisation amongst the working class. Because many thought, well, if the miners can't win after a year of intense struggle, you know, fierce class battles, then how on earth can we do it? And uh, <coughs> this, this actually further strengthened the Thatcher government, this kind of this, this demoralisation, who proceeded then to deregulate the entire economy, you know, things like the, the financial uh, big bang and so forth, so on, and open it up to foreign competition and, uh, and investment. 
And there was also a wave of privatizations which were conducted in quick succession as the government was actually afraid of, if we don't do it soon, we're going to be forced to have power. And we, we want to make sure this is irreversible. And uh, <coughs> it opened up an enormous field, therefore, for private investment, you know, private capital, into areas that were previously off limits. And so, therefore, nearly all the industries that were nationalized by the 1945 Labour government were actually privatized, including uh, energy, telecom, steel, coal, and transport, as well as actually privatizing most of the, uh, the council housing stock through the right to buy. And this struggle was also reflected in the Labour Party, which began to em actually empty out of activists. And uh, that, that, that process had begun in the 1970s uh, on the basis of the, the attacks of that government. But it, this continued in a large way under Thatcher. And it was in this kind of mood, this kind of process of generalised defeat, which the right wing actually took control of the Labour Party, first under Neil Kinnock, but later under Tony Blair. And they simply continued these policies. You know, they, they, they didn't have any alternative. They just continued what, what was, from the standpoint of the ruling class, necessary in order to keep the system going and make it profitable. Uh, it, wasn't the, it wasn't the case of it's just this nasty neoliberal policy, which is, they, they just happened to be brought up in. And also the collapse of the Soviet Union also played a big role in this, particularly worldwide, in actually strengthening the right wing, particularly in the, in the, the labour movement, uh, who constantly repeated that, well, you know, socialism is all very good, but actually there's no alternative. Look, this doesn't work. And uh, since they based themselves on capitalism, to them, to these leaders, there was no alternative. They were kind of, from their uh, mindset, they were, they, were, they were sincere. And uh, conditions were therefore being driven down across the whole world in a kind of race to the bottom. And nowhere was there, was there kind of a very powerful labour movement actually led with a Marxist leadership that was prepared to challenge capitalism and actually take power. Now, as, although Thatcher is one of the most famous ch uh, champions of, of what's referred to as neoliberalism, uh, she obviously wasn't the first to, to carry out these kind of policies. Before her, you had the Pinochet dictatorship in Chile, as well as similar policies being uh, carried out in the USA. Now, Chile is interesting. It's, it's often cited as the first example of neoliberalism. It's often described as a kind of testing ground or kind of experiment of these policies which would be copied and, uh, and, and put in place elsewhere. But I think it's important to see actually the full picture in that what actually happened was a developing revolution in Chile uh, since the early 1970s under the Allende government, which actually nationalised key industries and nationalised healthcare and so on. It began a programme of massive reforms which transformed the lives of millions of working class people and poor peasants and, and affected them deeply. And despite being led by uh, reformists, this, uh, this government unleashed a, a process of a mass movement uh, of millions of people who actually wanted to go far further than the intentions of the Allende government. And the ruling class feeling threatened by this, you know, by this mass mobilisation, actually mobilised their full might to try and bring down this government, with the full backing as well of, of uh, US imperialism, which was, uh, which was terrified about this revolution spreading to the rest of Latin America, that this domino theory uh, <coughs> thing. And remember, this was at the same time that they were sending hundreds of thousands of troops into Vietnam to try and cross the, uh, the revolution there. And with, uh, with Allende actually un unwilling to lead that struggle to the end, he was unwilling to arm the working class, despite, despite the advanced layers of the workers understanding clearly what was going on, the dangers of counter-revolution. Uh, he, was, he was unwilling to mobilise the ma masses against the capitalists. And uh, the situation came to a head with a successful counter-revolution. Uh, and that, and it, was, it was through that that you had the installation of General Pinochet, an extremely brutal um, military dictatorship which uh, sought to crush the labour movement, uh, killing thousands in the process and rolling back all the gains of the working class that they'd won through that past period. And in uh, 1975, you had a group of economists known as the Chicago Boys, because they were trained in the University of Chicago under Milton Friedman. Uh, they were sent in to restructure the economy for the benefit of the ruling class. And they set about, therefore, re uh, reversing the nationalisations, opening up the economy to foreign, uh, particularly American, investment, and sweeping away uh, welfare, removing kind of any kind of labour protections and so on. Therefore, it wasn't this kind of just evil neoliberal ideology which happened to just be experimented or tested in Chile. It was the policies enacted by a victorious capitalist counter-revolution in order to, to, to brutally crush a workers' revolution, restore profitability for the ruling class, and send a message to workers in other countries. Don't you try this elsewhere. Now, I just, uh, just wanted to mention the USA. Because uh, Ronald Reagan came to power in 1980 and famously enacted very similar uh, policies to, to Thatcher, ultimately for the same reasons, you know, to restore profitability and uh, <coughs> following the crisis of the 1970s. But before Reagan came in, you actually had the appointment of uh, a man called Paul Volcker, 
as chair, as a, he was a monetarist, as chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank. And in 1979, he massively increased the, in, the baseline interest rate, which of course had a, a knock-on effect across the whole of the rest of the world, since America was the kind of key capitalist uh, country. And by 1981, the nominal rate of interest had actually been raised to nearly 20%. Now, over the previous period, New York banks had actually lent an enormous amount of money to third world, uh, or so-called third world countries. And uh, <clears throat> with, with the raising of this interest rate, many of these uh, countries, many of these governments, therefore struggled to pay their debts and went into default. Therefore, they were forced to appeal to the IMF in order, uh, for, for loans and debt relief. Obviously, US banks are not humanitarian institutions. They're imperialist institutions. They serve the interests of the US ruling class. And so also is the IMF, which is a key tool of US imperialism. And the situation is kind of akin to, to taking out a loan from a mafia boss who then jacks up the interest rate, forces you into default, but forces you to seek uh, relief from, from the same mafia family. Now, uh, of course, they're going to demand their pound of flesh and they're going to squeeze you dry. And so the IMF used these defaults as opportunities to force these countries to open themselves up to foreign capital, to imperialism. And it's uh, what has become known as structural adjustment programs. And they provided debt relief but on condition that these countries privatise the nationalised industries, you know, remove protectionist tariffs and subsidies, cut back on welfare, remove uh, labour protections and so on, open up their economies to, to foreign investment. And that's precisely what happened in Mexico in 1972 uh, when Mexico was uh, forced into bankruptcy. Uh, <clears throat> but by 1994, the same process had been undertaken in, in uh, 14, no, 18 countries around the world, including Brazil, Argentina and Venezuela. And it continues to this day. For example, the bank bailouts in Greece, where the IMF and the EU, the ECB, known as the Troika, uh, would say, yeah, we'll give you the money, but as long as you privatise uh, what's left of uh, the nationalised economy and reduce welfare and deregulate and so on. And uh, without the working class parties prepared to break with capitalism, what choice do they have? You know, either you break, either you, uh, break with uh, capitalism or you accept their terms. So uh, <clears throat> that's really what I think uh, this is about, neoliberalism. I think it, it, ex it expresses the bankruptcy of reformism. And uh, it, it's, neoliberalism, you can't see it as, it as existing in a vacuum. I uh, say so neoliberalism and reformism are simply two sides of the same capitalist coin. And uh, in all these situations I've outlined, you know, Britain, Chile, Latin America and so on, the ruling class was able to go on the offensive and actually roll back all the, the gains of, that the working class had won through struggle previously precisely because of the failure of left-wing reformists to actually change society when they were in power in, in, uh, previously, which of course would have meant breaking with capitalism. Now Britain and Chile are striking examples of this. Uh, taking Britain, the labour movement in the 1970s was managing capitalism. It was carrying out cuts and austerity and actually just started what Thatcher continued. Or take the, the, you know, the failure of Allende to lead the revolution in Chile to victory. It prepared the conditions for the, uh, the counter-revolution. And that brings me on to, therefore, neoliberalism today. So, you know, with, with an increase in protectionism, uh, <coughs> you know, is neoliberalism going out of fashion? You know, what about the return of Keynesian policies? You know, does, does this mean that, uh, you know, uh, well, according to pure neoliberal theory, uh, that the government shouldn't interfere with the market? But, of course, the government does interfere with the market. Look at the bank bailouts of 2008. What about China, which has embarked on the biggest Keynesian spending program in history <coughs> in order to stave off crisis since 2008? They did this by quadrupling their debt in the space of seven years uh, to over 235% of GDP. They spent massively on infrastructure, uh, housing, roads, railways, heavy industry, and so on. They poured more concrete in three years than the USA did in the whole of the 20th century, which is a staggering statistic. And the, the result of that now is massive overproduction. And it's reflected in chronic overcapacity in Chinese heavy industry, and actually the existence of these kind of ghost industries, like whole cities, which are kind of effectively empty. And it's inevitably heading towards a crash. You know, nothing fundamentally has been solved. And I say this proves the inability of Keynesianism to actually solve a crisis and fix capitalism. But I say I wouldn't see this as a sign that neoliberalism is dead. In fact, I would say nowhere in history have the, have the capitalists ever adopted like a pure neoliberalist uh, program. You know, they just take whatever measures are necessary uh, and, uh, <coughs> that they feel that they can get away with, given the class balance of forces in each particular circumstance. Hence the relaxation of monetarist policy in the early 1980s in Britain and Chile when unemployment was actually skyrocketing to, uh, to dangerous levels. Hence as well the payout of the banks in 2008. And I see the key, the key thing today is that there's a world crisis of capitalism. 
Therefore, to end neoliberalism by capitalist policies necessarily means ending capitalism. And ultimately, it's not the capitalists who dictate policies to governments. It's the policies are dictated to the capitalists by the very crisis of the system for which they have no way out. And hence the adoption of austerity policies by governments of the left and the right all across the world on the basis of capitalism, they don't have any kind of alternative. <laughs> hence why, you know, the social, so-called Socialist Party in France ended up implementing vicious anti-worker laws. It's not that they just happen to be, uh, you know, neoliberals. It's that uh, they accept capitalism. They therefore have to play by its logic. And that, that this also has a lot of lessons for the Corbyn movement. Because, of course, we support Corbyn. You know, but we've got to say, honestly, how is he going to implement his programme given this worldwide crisis of capitalism? And I think we can discuss that in the discussion on a lot more in, in the next session. But I think there's, there's clearly a layer of activists who think that all we need to do is just, just reject nasty neoliberalism and therefore return to Keynesianism and we'll have a repeat of the post-war boom. And I've tried to say, show why that isn't possible, since the conditions that gave rise to that boom do not exist in the world uh, today. And I say the only reason, the only real way to get out of this crisis is to break with the market is to break with capitalism, so take the vast productive forces that capitalism has created and uh, take them over on a worldwide scale, run them democratically for people's needs and not for profit. And I'll leave it there.